What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Left Legged Legend. It's your boy, Big Link Johnson. I'm sitting here and uh, I'm inside the courtyard of the Kaiser building in Palmdale, California, uh, West Avenue L. And I wanted to touch base today. I'm here for my, what I'm calling my pre-pre-op. The doctor needed to take some fluid out of my knee uh, to test it to make sure that it was not in any infections or that or take cultures to see that make sure that it doesn't grow into um, anything infectious because that's very important you can't get metal inside your body with an infection the infections are smart enough to know that they can hide in and around the metal um, and the antibiotics don't help and so um, he hasn't mentioned a pick line yet but I've had quite a few of those. I haven't mentioned those yet. So let's back up a little bit and talk about that. So sometimes you get an infection where regular uh, antibiotics don't work. You don't have the opportunity to take antibiotics and it gets rid of it. So what they do is they put a pick line in your arm. Now I just took some labs, so don't get alarmed. I don't have a pick line yet, but you're gonna see my um, bandage for my alarm. So when you get a pick line, I'm trying to see if you can, oh yeah, you can see them very clear. So that's three, and then I have one. Oh, sorry, I have one on this arm. I've had four pick lines. Now, what a pick line is is a uh, uh, don't get me to lying. Um, it's a catheter that they put inside the the uh, artery in your arm, and it and then you inject antibiotics into it. That's a very uh, Lincoln way to tell you what it is, but that's what it is. Um, it's something like peripheral enter something catheter. Um, I'll figure it out for the next time and then we'll go from there. But um, so I've had four pick lines. You get them for about six weeks each. Um, and on the last one, they've been pretty successful at getting rid of the infections. The first infection I got was Staphylococcus um, methicillin susceptible Staphylococcus aureus and two pick lines got rid of that. The second infection I got was um, uh, Staphylococcus lungdenensis um, and, and from what I understand it's not a deadly infection it's a uh, it's more of a nuisance it, it was would uh, I guess foam is the best way to say it so that infection would foam inside your body and it just kind of makes everything swell up bust out of your skill skin and all that kind of stuff so anyway the third and fourth catheter helped but when i got the third catheter and um thank god for my buddy gary hopper um when i got the third catheter one of the home nurses came to check it out and he went to clean it and messed it all up you know uh pulled it out a little ways and i mean it was fucked up and so I went to the emergency room with this, with this lot, with that third pick line, I went to the emergency room three or four times and my buddy took me every time. And, um, it was halfway out. And so what happened was they said, keep it in there, keep giving myself the antibiotics. They didn't want to disrupt it. And they didn't want to put another one in there before that one healed. So they said, you know, do the last couple of weeks with it in there. But what had happened was, um, it had clotted. So my blood was trying to push it out of my body so it had clotted on the end of it so when they went to put the fourth pick line in after surgery umpteen um it wouldn't go and i kept feeling it hit something so i i told the the ultrasound technician i'm like it's a it's a a blood clot in there i can feel it and you know they usually say oh well we can't diagnose anything or we you have to talk to the doctor i'm like come on baby boo uh, no, that's a blood clot. And she's like, yeah, 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 it's a blood clot. <laughs> so anyway, that's a way to deal with the infection. And I, I'm saying all of that to bring it back to surgery number five. Surgery number five, you know, I know I mentioned it in the last episode, but surgery number five, I was, um, I, they just put me under, you know, and I woke up at having had a surgery. Now at the time, I didn't know what kind of surgery it was, um, but I woke up and, and, knew that I had been in surgery 
And finally, somebody gave a name to what was wrong with me, Methicillin Susceptible Staphylococcus aureus. Now, most people are uh, familiar with Methicillin Resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, MRSA, MRSA. Um, but I was fortunate enough to get the, the one that was susceptible to methicillin. Um, in addition, uh, one of the things, you know, I've, I've always had pretty good health throughout my life. You know, I played football, um, I ran track badly, played baseball badly, you know, grew up across the street from a park. I swam every summer. I go to the beach. I love to swim. I love to work out, lift weights and all of that stuff. Um, but I've always been a big dude. I was 200 pounds in junior high. Uh, I graduated high school at about 275. Although I was in shape and, and buff, I was always big link and people always called me fat. So even when I was skinny, I didn't even get to enjoy being fat, but that's another, that's a whole other vlog. Um, but anyway, one of the things that <clears throat> one of the doctors told me was that being overweight saved my life, that the, the, Staphylococcus aureus had flesh and and tissue that it could eat on without going into my bone. And so that was a concern. The concern was that this infection will get into my bones and that I would end up with a, an infection inside my bones and they'll have to start um, amputating my limbs. Um, and I went and saw some uh, infection specialists so I, t I, I would talk to them and they would tell me you know how to fight the infection things that I need to be doing and um, you know learning all of that stuff and so um, the next thing the doctor want, needed me to deal with this infection you know I was fortunate that the infection hadn't got down in my bone. I had that infection for 14 months. So if you could imagine from hurting my knee and the first surgery in June 2010 to the sixth surgery, which I'm getting to in June 2011, I had that um, Staphylococcus aureus inside my body without anything. I took Cipro, Ciploflozaxin or something like that. It's really supposed to be good for anthrax, you know. Um, but what the Cipro did was make it dormant. So that's why my thigh busted open after the fourth surgery. And if you look, you can still see where my thigh busted open. It's this thick line right there. That's where it, that deep, thick line, that's where it busted open. You know, when they put it back together, it made scar tissue. Um, so anyway, this led to surgery number six. And so... In surgery number six, I was sent to the Grossman Burn Center. Now, the Grossmans are the doctors that saved Richard Pryor's life when he burned himself. And they've saved countless people's lives over the years with burns and infections and things that come from being burned, skin grafts and, and that sort of thing. So um, of one of the greatest things that happened to me in this process was to get referred to the Grossman Burn Center. And um, so they they did surgery number two, actually, where they tried to clean out the, the infection, but that didn't work. So now their next plan was to do what they call a gastroc flap, where you cut your, well, what they were gonna do on me, I don't know if it's all the time, but they take your calf muscle and they cut it in half and they kind of wrapped it around my knee um, so that the blood and the tissue would be right there so that when the infection went to get into my knee, because at this point, the Staphylococcus aureus knew to hide on that knee. There's no way that antibiotics can save you from that knee other than having a spacer and other than having a, other than having an antibiotic spacer. I forget that you haven't, you haven't heard that part of the story yet, it's coming. Other than having an antibiotic spacer and other than um, having a pick line uh, going with the an antibiotic straight to your heart, you know, you can't, there's no way to kill it. So it wants to survive. So it lives on the metal. And so um, they wanted to put my muscle there so that it would feed the um, feed the infection. Now I've lost a lot of muscle mass because I haven't been using this leg. I've been on crutches for a while, but just so you can see the, I hope you can see the skin graft is right here. They took skin off my thigh and put the skin graft. You can tell my leg, I got a chicken leg, right? Because it has no calf muscle and it's atrophied. 
but and then it's wrapped around my knee so if I concentrate really hard I can flex my knee I don't know if you can see that because I can't see what you can see. But next time I'll turn the camera around. You know, you live and learn. Left leg, left legged legend. You know, it's a it's a work in progress. So anyway, I was so upset when they gave me that surgery. That was surgery number six. I was so upset, y'all. I cried. I thought it was for nothing. At this point, I thought the doctors just, now they just want to fucking make money off of me. They're just about to do anything they can to mangle this leg and and make money off of me. And so I, I was so hurt about this surgery, but I found out later from a surgeon that I really love and like that I'm gonna introduce you to, I mean, in description, not in real life, hopefully in real life, keep your fingers crossed. Cause if that doctor, if I could talk to that doctor again, you know, I would kiss him, you know? Um, but he told me that that's the surgery that saved me. That's the surgery that saved me from infection inside my bones. That's the surgery that saved me from having to get something amputated. Um, so, you know, big ups to the Grossman Burn Center. You know, the recovery was a little tricky. I used to have to get into one of those bariatric chambers. It's like a pressurized air chamber. And that was to help me not get infected. But that thing, first of all, it felt like a coffin. It felt like getting in a coffin every day for 90 minutes or whatever it was. So the first time I was able to do it, and then I don't know if you've ever been in something that's pressurized, but before you can just pop out, it has to be unpressurized. So, you know, there were times, I would ask them to give me sedatives because I would get really bad anxiety laying in a coffin. It, I'd be locked in there. And even if you panic and need to get out, it still takes, you know, five minutes for that thing to depressurize. And that's the longest five minutes ever. Um, so I, uh, you know, you, you, sometimes you get nauseous in there, so I'd have to throw up and I have to signal the guy five minutes before I had to really throw up because, you know, throwing up inside a pressurized air chamber would probably be pretty traumatic for me and the guy that has to clean it out. So anyway, um, that was a real tough, uh, tough recovery having to take baths and like a I don't know if any of you ever lived in the country but my my grandmother lived in Ozona Texas big up to the Castillo family mi familia that lived next door to uh to my grandmother they um she used to I used to have to bathe in like a metal tub you know in the backyard I don't know I'm pretty sure she had a bathroom and running water but we had to bathe in this, I had to bathe in this tub out in the backyard. But anyway, I say all that to say that uh, recovering from this surgery, I would have to get in a tub. There was this uh, Russian nurse. I probably shouldn't tell this story, but this is Russian nurse. She had a little crush on me and um, I'd wake up sometimes and she'd have her hand on my face, just staring into my eyes. And, and then, you know, she'd take me to this tub and give me a, a bath in the tub or whatever. I mean, nothing inappropriate. But um, it was just really, it was really cool at that time to have somebody there that I felt cared, you know, um, but I digress. So anyway, that's through surgery number six. Um, you know, we're almost halfway there. It seems like we're going a little slower, but I think that it's a lot of stuff that I skip over that I haven't told you. Right now, my surgery is scheduled for October 13th. Today is September 2nd, 2020. My surgery is scheduled for October 13th. Um, I just got through talking to the doctor and, you know, this doctor is, I, I like him too, Dr. O'Donnell. You'll see him. I, I haven't gotten the nerve, the courage to ask him to get on left legged legend yet, but at some point I will. I, I was thinking after the surgery, um, cause I don't want to make him think that I'm trivializing, you know, this traumatic event that's going to take place in my life. But, um, at some point you'll meet him. Um, maybe sometime I'll call the other doctor that I'll introduce you to later on. Um, but I, w I want to make sure that I document everything. I want to make sure that people get a chance to kind of see what I'm going through. And, you know, if you know somebody that has a lot of surgeries or needs to have knee surgery or joint surgery and wants to talk to somebody, I mean, please send them my way because I wish that I had the forethought to 
ask questions and, and talk stuff. I mean, when we get to the this surgery, you'll see when it came to amputation, I was all in till I talked to a few people that had had it and realized what it was about. And I think I mentioned that before. So, you know, this ain't just for me. This ain't just some egotistic way to tell you how courageous I am or what I've been through because I don't feel like that. I have a low threshold for pain. I'm a big ass baby. I've been fighting not crying on this camera more than you need to know and so you know anybody going through this man send them my way we need to form a community and and those of you that don't go through this need to hear this so that you can understand that you know a, a lot of times in my recovery uh people felt like i should be doing better i should walk better and i should have lost weight and i should have and should have and should have you know and you know, all of that is bullshit. You know, until you've had a situation where somebody cut in your leg 12 or 13 times, and, and for some people it's 40 times, I'm by no means the worst case. Um, you never really know. So if you're working with somebody, cause I'm dealing with some stuff at work with not wanting to accommodate my disability and the things that I need to be able to do and people being hard on me um, because they, you guys don't understand. And it's a lonely, loveless feeling to be going through this and people trivialize it uh people think well you should be better now you know because you think after a surgery you know a few weeks after a surgery you know you should be walking you should be able to move your leg it, this it has to be something that you're doing that stops you from being able to walk and and being able to not be in pain and and to do things like regular people but it's not that nobody wants to walk more than i do nobody wants to wish that it was not this hard than I do. There's no way that you standing on your two feet that work well and your knees that are yours and are organic that God, Buddha, Muhammad, you know, gave to you or whatever deity you you um, submit to, gave to you. You know, um, I want nothing more than to do that. And if I could take a pill or snap my finger or snap myself into it, by God, I would do it. Because as some of you know that know me personally, that um, I love to dance, you know, I love to do yoga. I love to walk, you know, I'm not a, a lazy person, you know, but I, life has dealt me a different set of circumstances. Um, and while I'm at it, you know, I know I'm running long and whatever, but bear with me. While I'm at it, I also want to say something about uh, systemic and and social racism, too. Um, and I don't mean in a sense of, uh, you know, black, me as a black man being held down, because that's a whole nother blog. But what I mean is that when you look at me, I'm a big black man and I seem tough and I've been through a lot. I grew up in Compton uh, in the hood and I've been through some stuff and I've made it through some challenges and all of that shit. But you don't know how many 